Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this session is, is called How to Scale This, Taking Food from Healthy Soils to the High Street. So if you're on the wrong bus, you can leave now without upsetting us. But if you get up in the next few minutes, then we're a sensitive lot. So uh, we're hoping you're going to stay. But you're, you're very welcome. Um, uh, so my name's William Kendall, and I'm going to introduce my uh, panel uh, in a few minutes. But well, it, we've got Emily Bull on my left, um, Ed Lees from Wild Farms, and Tim Mead from Yo Valley, who's, who's paying for the tent. So a particular, <laughs> um, particular welcome to Tim. Um, so I'm William Kendall. Um, I, farm, I, I grew up on a farm down the road. I'm just over the border in Bedfordshire, which uh, we didn't cross into North Hertfordshire very much. But in modern times, we're more welcome here. Um, I farm also with my wife in, in Suffolk. We have an organic regenerative farm. Um, and we sell everything we produce on the farm under our brand, which we invented ourselves. It's called Maple Farm Kelsell, which is the name of the farm. Inventing brands isn't expensive and difficult. Um, I built a number of brands over the years. Um, I, they've always been where we're trying to sort of disrupt something, where we're trying to do something different. And I sort of, you know, I think that's the theme today. So the first brand I worked on was New Covent Garden Soup. And we were making, trying to make homemade soups using only ingredients you'd find in your own kitchen, but for a, busy, a busier and busier household. And with the current discussions around ultra-processed foods, you know, it reminds me of 30 years ago when we came up with that rather radical idea of only using ingredients that were familiar to the average cook. At Green and Blacks, we were making high-quality, premium-priced chocolate using organic ingredients, and knowing that cacao was the most sprayed commodity crop grown in the world. And we sold the UK's first fair trade product. And now I chair Causton Press, um, which rec we recognise that most soft drinks contain a lot of ingredients that many of us would prefer not to consume. So we just make our drinks with pressed, pressed juice and water. Um, those are, well, those have been successful brands. I've been involved with so many failures that I, I haven't got time to list them all. Um, if we'd been holding this talk two years ago, I think on the panel might have been Farm Drop, a business that I was on the board of. But Farm Drop disappeared, not without trace, but disappeared, um, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, or 18 months ago. Um, I, I, I chaired a business called Moises Stevens, the Royal Florist, where we tried to push flowers with a provenance, and we failed and lost quite a lot of money in the process. So I'm not entirely clear what the answer is to this question. I'm hoping my panelists are going to um, shed some light on it, and we're going to come away with some clear ideas. Um, but I don't think this is an easy, an easy question to answer. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion as much as I hope you are. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Emily, Emily Bull from FAI, I, FA, I can't even say it, FAI Farms. You need to sharpen up that term. FAI. Yeah, you can, you so can say it. You can say it. <laughs> so, hello, so, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, William. Um, so, unlike the others on the stage, I'm, I'm actually a bit more difficult to explain because we aren't a recognised food brand. But what we do do is work with food, major food brands globally. So, we are a multidisciplinary team. We're made up of vets, uh, scientists, farmers, um, software developers, um, IT people, lots of different people. Um, and we um, basically have two kind of key arms to the business. Um, so our first first kind of area, and our, we have one really firm foot um, in farming. So that's the, the first key one. And then our other foot um, straddles that, and then we also have a, a consultancy arm. Um, and we believe both of these areas are really key to driving change. So just to give you a bit of context of what we do on the farming side, so we have um, a farm business tenancy with Oxford University. So that's um, 1,600 acres. Um, we are um, EOV savoury um, certified. Um, we are in a four-year regenerative transition um, with amp grazing, with um, a suckler herd, um, as well as also having a dairy beef herd, um, and that is funded by Innovate um, UK. So looking to really think about how the dairy beef can um, to move away from big inputs um, and just be finished on grass. Um, so the system that we're running, and this has all got context, um, so the system that we're running, um, we, we don't use any chemicals, um, we don't have to buy any purchase feed-in, we've had 24% increase in life, um, daily live weight gain, 
um, as well as reduce the slaughter age. Um, we're outwintering all the cows, so that results in £200 per head um, on, uh, on saved on the, each of those cows. We are increasing biodiversity significantly, so rare cattle egrets, um, lots of like new um, plants coming up, lots of orchids in the meadows, um, and also significantly increased water infiltration. So probably a little bit off the topic, but the reason I'm telling you all of that is that the reason we have the farm is because it is critical for how we engage, engage with our clients. So the Oxford farm provides us with a really nice space to bring all of our clients, those major food brands, um, bring them to the farm and really explain what regenerative agriculture is. So that we're moving away from it being something that's very commercially driven and something that looks nice on paper because it's popular and everyone wants, everyone wants to be doing it, to really starting to show what regenerative agriculture is and what those main benefits are. So we're, we're kind of showing what happens to the water, what happens to the soil, um, and what happens to energy flows, um, so that they can get excited about it and really back it at um, a corporate level. So not just the, the commercial exercise, but we also have the kind of the consultancy side, um, and there's three kind of key areas to that. So we, we provide training, um, so mindset, mindset and cultural shift. Um, so looking at ecosystem processes, not just looking at pro um, the principles of regenerative agriculture, but actually looking at outcomes on the ground. Um, we provide online training, which um, you can go onto our website and you can find, um, as well as corporate away days, like I said before, bringing people onto the farm to really show what regenerative agriculture is. And then in terms of kind of the, the next kind of key area we work in is strategy. So helping to design regenerative approaches, um, thinking about how to measure and report those regenerative process, processes, um, and making sure that we are promising, um, that the brands that we're working with are making promises to consumers and they are delivering on those um, and then supporting them to make change. And then the kind of the final thing that we do is the, the implementation and measuring. So we're currently running two um, large-scale pilots. Um, one is with Arla, and I can see some wonderful farmers um, in the audience. Um, uh, that's working with 26 farms across the UK and Europe. Um, and then we're also running, um, and that's, sorry, that's the dairy farms. And then we're also running um, a pilot with McDonald's, with Amp Grazing, um, and that's just in the UK. Um, so... That's really useful for us. We're, we're you know, making lots of leaps and bounds with, with what we're doing with the farmers and really starting to understand how people can start to scale um, and actually make that regenerative um, transition. That's great. Sorry, I've got to put my mic up. Ed, I, knew I can say wild farmed. Yeah. Um, so everyone knows you're bringing rock and roll to farming. Um, but tell us... <laughs> as I said... Um, so tell us a bit more about, there's probably no one in the audience who doesn't know about Wild Farm, but if there are, are a few, can you just spell out a little bit more about what you're up to? Yeah, um, Wild Farmed was uh, founded by people who had no background in farming or food. Uh, most of you probably know Andy, if you weren't uh, listening to his uh, talk earlier about um, disease pressure, you may have been dancing on the tables last night, <laughs> or if not, come and join us to dance on the tables tonight. Um, but the, the point is Andy came across this article about modern agriculture and the, and the issues with it, and it led all of us, our ever-growing team, down this uh, spectacular rabbit hole where we realised that the prevailing system just wasn't working, and the fact that none of us had had that background was actually very helpful in having a fresh set of eyes, whether it was uh, from the fields, which, as any of you can see from my hands, I'm no farmer, uh, all the way through to the supply chain because um, what was being expected of the farmers was to bear all the cost and all the risk across this business. And I remember when I first started helping Andy, I looked at it and said, this is a business where you don't know uh, how much you're going to get uh, at the end of the year. You don't know what price you're going to sell it for and you don't know how much it's going to cost you to make it. I thought we need to redo this. The, the risk reward is, is wrong all across the supply chain. Um, so where are we today? We are working with a variety of different people. Like you say, bringing rock and roll to it is one way of saying it, but trying to bring it into the cultural zeitgeist. It's great to be here. I was here two years ago. I think there was a third of the people uh, coming here now. The, the, the scale of this movement is great, but we have to expand it way beyond this. We have to get it into, um, 
into the supply chains. We have to get it into the hands of consumers. And Tim, I'm so happy he's here because he has experience of how do we get the supermarkets, how do we get retail involved in this? How do we get it into the urban consumers' hands? Like where Andy lived in France, it was great to have small farm-to-table networks. And where they exist, that's great. I would love to eat from those myself. But the fact of the matter is 80% of us are going to be living in cities by 2035. So how do we get food grown in these systems uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in these major supply chains? So Tim's going to tell us how we get uh, supermarkets to list them. But the really important piece and what I think Wild Farm stands for in this is how do we get consumers to feel part of it? Because I don't think it's by giving them agricultural lectures. I think it's by making it feel accessible. Whether you're a grower, we say, come, just get started. Come and do some fields. The organic movement's been amazing, and they're huge, huge allies of ours. But the long and short of it is it's prohibitive for a number of growers. Uh, a lot of bakers will say, I don't want to change all my flour supply for a variety of reasons. That's fine. Just do a few SKUs. And into the, uh, into the much more um, large-scale manufacturers, we say, just use a percentage of some of these flour. And I understand this doesn't uh, sit well with some of the purists, and that's fine. I, ca I can live with that. Because another thing we stand for is not letting perfection get in the way of progress. History is littered with infighting amongst revolutionaries. And maybe you guys don't all sit there thinking you're a bunch of revolutionaries. But that is what we are. And we all have our part to play. And, uh, and our part in this is engaging people who've never heard about it, an urban community who have no idea about the rural um, landscape, of which I was one uh, 10 years ago before I met Andy. We want to bring everyone on this journey and, um, and make it a decision that, uh, that you can be part of every time you put food in your mouth. Well, thanks very much, Ed. And by the way, Ed used the word skew. Um, the, the Nick Robinson in me from the Today programme needs to t point out that skew means a stock-keeping unit for those of you that aren't in retail. Tim, you are. You're a legend. You have, a, you have created a brand. We are relying on you to tell us how this is all going to work. I know you're going to show some slides, so provide a bit of intellectual rigor to our presentation, so that's even better. We'll attempt to do the technology in a second. Um, this is my um, third career, actually, at the moment. I was an accountant for four years. I was a yogurt maker and organic brand owner for 30 years, and I'm now in my third year as a farming apprentice to my mother, who is still in charge of our, our farms and our dairy herds. So I was lucky to make that transition at the time when regenerative farming was beginning to get noticed. Um, and if I go back to the last few years of the, the Yo Valley yogurt brand, um, about three years ago, we were inundated with retailers and market researchers clamoring and saying that unless we introduce plant-based yogurts, that we wouldn't have a business. Unless we went into plant-based milk, we wouldn't have a business. Um, and it was the regenerative farming movement and coming here that made us realize that actually brands that just offset into trees, brands that are food brands that ignore the soil are probably going in the wrong direction. So we were getting carried away with the with the sort of the hype of everything's got to be plant-based and then groundswell and regenerative farming sort of rooted us back into our roots um, and we realized that we needed to understand a huge, a huge amount about what is actually happening in the soil, how much carbon we're able to put in the soil um, and that's what we've been doing for the last two or three years. So instead of moving with the trends to a plant-based brand, we're now going to start introducing meat into the O Valley range because we should be proud of everything that we do on our farms and the integrated livestock mixed farming system that is at the center of in, um, regenerative farming is core to what we do. So we're just gonna stay true to our core values. Um, the slides that I'm going to flip through, and sorry for death by PowerPoint, people have probably had enough slides in their lives now never to want to do it again, but I thought it would be easier just to flick through and then we can have discussions and inputs from anybody who wants to make comments. What I try to do is give an insight into how retailers think and how it is then possible for us in the regenerative farming movement to make products more available to consumers and to democratize the type of farming that we're, we're trying to do. 
So the answer to the question of how do we take food grown in healthy soil to the high street is to get it listed in the high street. Um, and now um, I'll try and do the first slide. Oh. Um, the caveat is, is that you can take food grown in a very good regenerative farming system and turn it into complete rubbish. So it's not just that we want to take food from the right farming system to the high street. We want to take food from the right farming system in its right form to the high street. Um, and the Yeo Valley True North is that we want to produce natural, healthy food from the right farming system that is good for people and the planet. Um, but the really big watch out and possibly coming up behind regenerative farming in consumer consciousness is ultra-processed food. And at Yeo Valley, ultra-processed food is our number one enemy. Um, next slide. Um, so obviously, there's a very simple answer to lots of things. How you actually deliver that answer and make it happen, change the content of the high street basket is what we have to do. So we have to take products that are grown in the right farming system using the sun's energy powered by soil and remove products that are from an oil-based farming system. And apologies for anybody who works for any of the brands on the, the right hand or the left hand side. Next slide. This is just the Yeo Valley True North. You know, down the pub when anybody's going, what do you do if you work for Yeo Valley? We just want people to say, we produce natural healthy food good for us and good for the planet. Next slide. Obviously, the debate about how much carbon you can store, how much is able to be you know, reversed into the soil. Soil has three times more carbon than the biosphere and three times more carbon than the atmosphere. At Yeo Valley, we've done a trial with 25 farms and we've baselined the carbon in those 25 farms. And unfortunately, all the marketeers want to know, has it gone up next year? Has it gone up the year after? It's taken us 100 years to deplete soil carbon. It's not going to take two years to put it back. So from our, our perspective, and to try and reiterate that, we're framing our soil carbon building over the next 40 years. And all we have to do is increase our soil carbon by 25% over the next 40 years, and everything we'll have produced won't have a footprint. Um, and we're working with the 25 supplying farmers um, to do the same on their farms. Next slide. This is just to point out that I think the stats, and somebody might have a, a better handle on this than I do, but I think 50% of the calories we consume aren't from the retailers in the high street. I think 50% of the calories that we as a nation consume are consumed out of home on the high street, you know, in the cafes and the shops and the planes and the trains and the automobiles. So whilst finding regenerative and food grown from healthy soil into the retail high street is important, we must never forget the fact that every time you travel, every time you go to prison probably, or to school, that you'll be consuming food. Hopefully school more than prison. Um, next slide. And never really having been to a football game, but apparently it's a, you know, rugby is the sort of West Country thing, really. Um, it's a game of two halves, I think, is something that people say occasionally when they're doing commentary. And obviously, this is stating the obvious, there's the demand side, which is you know, getting consumers to want the products. And then there's the supply side, which is the farmers and the retailers and the processors wanting to deliver the products. Everything that I've seen at Groundswell last year and this year leads me to believe that farmers want to be a solution to climate change. They want to regenerate their soils. And therefore, I don't think we've got a problem getting the supply side right. And I think a lot of it will then come down to the demand side. Next slide. Um, I couldn't quite work out. This is the sort of UN's sustainability goals, which they I think there's 23 or 26. And when I first did the slide, and you put the word UN sustainable, um, you get unsustainable, which was a bit weird. Um, but I think you know we'll have to work that one through. So what retailers, most retailers use the UN sustainability goals to help their businesses 
frame what they're going to do. Um, and therefore, we're all beginning to talk the same sort of language. Um, can we have the next slide? So even in the Yo Valley business, we take the impacts that we're looking to, to um, measure across our business over the next five or ten years, and we categorize them by the UN sustainability goals. Um, next slide. And lo and behold, so do all the retailers. So when the retailers are saying, you know, this is what we're going to measure our impacts, and they're doing that and framing it by the UN sustainability goals, a lot of the UN sustainability goals are about producing food from healthy soils, and therefore what you're actually doing is delivering them a solution to the common currency of what they're trying to achieve as well. Next slide. This is a Yo Valley sort of, we've always tried to democratize organic products, get them to as many people as possible. Um, and people in the, in, the, in the modern world, they don't have, not everybody has time to be an activist. What we've got to do as a food brand is to make the right choices for our customers and get them to trust us so that when, they, when they're shopping, they go, that's okay, I trust Yo Valley are doing the right thing. Um, and therefore, I don't have to do, I don't know, go on the pitch at Lords and throw stuff around or the snooker tables or the, the whatever. Not everybody wants to be like that. Some people do, and I think that's absolutely right. And we should need them, and we need them to do more. Um, but as a brand and in the high street, you've just got to make things very easy for consumers. Next slide. Um, so that goes back to the same old thing. Let's just get the right products in the basket. So if there are 40 products in the average UK shopping basket, Organic has managed to get one of those products every week into the basket. So Organic is at about 2%, 2.5% of the total market. So of the 40 products that everybody, the average consumer is buying, in the last however many years, um, we've managed to get that to one. Um, if we get it to 10, then obviously 25% of the UK shopping basket could come from a system that is, is um, from grown and healthy soil. Um, next slide. Then also in terms of current, current common currency, the World Wildlife Fund, and I'm not sure if anybody is here from the World Wildlife Fund, um, but I'm not sure why they are now the custodians for all those retailers of the UK shopping basket but they are. I think it's something to do with if they're going to protect wildlife, they need to protect wildlife habitat. So therefore, they need to ensure that food comes from the right farming system. But all those retailers have signed up to the Sustainable Basket um, program as run by the World Wildlife Fund. And if we go to the next slide. And there's a single large part of... I thought we'd put the panda on there because it's always cute. It's not a badger. Um, <laughs> the um, the uh, lots of dairy farmers around them. Uh, <laughs> then, um, so what they're trying to do is Im allow the retailers to put better things in their baskets by making better choices and sourcing them from um, regenerative organic farming systems. So the good news is that the UN sustainability goals are being a, co a, common, a common currency, and the World Wildlife Fund is also helping people to put the right retailers to put the right things in the basket. Um, and then every time you go somewhere, you've got to try and sell something. And that's the next slide. So if anybody wants to come along to Valley Fest, which is a festival in Somerset at the beginning of August, um, there's a regenerative farming tent, and there is actual food. You know, you can still eat pizzas, burgers, mac and cheese from regenerative farming systems. You don't have to eat lettuce at a festival to be regenerative supporters of regenerative farming. So there are tickets still available. Discount codes are on your seat, um, and it'll be great to see a load of you there. Ed's going to be there, um, and I think Andy's playing as well. And Banana Rama, they're still going. <laughs> that has to be good news. Who knew it? Who knew it? <laughs> Headlining on Sunday. So I hope that's a bit of an insight as to somebody who's worked in food and retailing as to how I think the 
we should attack the system, you know, come up with a solution. So, Tim, that, I mean, that's great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to, yep. to your festival. Um, I think we're all going to be there. Um, th I was struck by your slide where you say that um, on the supply side, you d what did you say? There's no problem. You say farmers want to supply. And I'm sure that's right. And, and coming to a festival like this, you certainly think it. But, I mean, would that it was quite as easy as all of this? I mean, the farmers, you know, I, I, well, we, we live in an age where cost of living is... Bang, we're banging on, banging on about it the whole time. We've had the supermarket bosses called in um, by the government only this week, or by, by Parliament now. Um, you know, something's got to give, hasn't it? Oh, you, you, your slides, which are, are great and, and very instructive, but they describe the system that we're in at the moment, and the system that we're in is the system that's caused the problem. So I'm just trying, does something have to give to, to, to break out of it? Shorter supply chain, I don't know, but but just to, and this is a question for all of you, by the way. So you start thinking. <laughs> yeah. um, no time to think. Um, I think you know the government calling in the retailers, you know, accusing them of profiteering. Um, you know, I think that's just politics. Um, I don't think they are profiteering. I think there are food companies that are, you know, th producing ultra processed food and selling food that is not really food is profiteering. I don't think. They're profiteering on the natural healthy food. So I think it is, you know, FMCG huge companies that are getting the biggest slice of the margin. I, I so, don't, Ed, you, yeah. I mean, what yeah. do you think? Exactly. I think it's about reimagining supply chains. We, um, we live in a world of digital localism today. Traceability and transparency uh, exists in a way that it never has before. Uh, I'm of the opinion that in a short space of time, we should all be asking, where is it grown? Who is it grown by? And, uh, and how? And, uh, and if someone can't demonstrate that, I would recommend that you don't put that food in your mouth. Yeah, yeah. And Emily, you're, you're working where well, you mentioned some of the brands, some of the biggest brands in the world. Um, and, you know, I'm sure they have responsible supply chains, but... They are part of the existing system, which means that the current system, which means that the primary producers are getting a very, very small slice of the action. So how are you, how's your work with them going to change all of this? How are you going to incentivize us farmers to produce, to carry on producing, especially when we've got alternatives? We can rewild our land now. We can sell biodiversity credits. We can sell carbon. You know, food production could easily become a byproduct of, of another system, which, you know, as a farmer, I'm thinking, well, at least I've got a choice for the first time. Yeah, and I think ideally, like everyone on this stage, probably everyone in this room, we want to buy local food. And our role with the, the clients we work with is to make, um, to make it accessible for everyone. Um, and that's about working with the farmers, empowering the farmers to make change. And, and the work that we're doing with the pilots is very much putting that power back in the farmers' hands. So allowing them to make to have trials, supporting them on the trials, accepting that regenerative change is not going to happen overnight. We have to take kind of a stepwise approach. We have to support them in their journeys, um, create knowledge exchange, make sure these farmers are in the room. And, and we're so lucky to have this this kind of festival where you know actually the last few weeks have been buzzing with regenerative agriculture movements. Uh, and we're really lucky to have that in the UK. I don't, um, we were talking before, weren't we? And I'm not sure that it's quite as big in other countries, uh, especially in Europe. Um, and, and you can see the difference. You can see the difference in, in that groundswell movement. Um, so it's very much our role um, as the kind of the critical friends to the, the, the major brands we work with to make sure that they are delivering on ecosystem processes, they are delivering on outcomes, um, and they are delivering um, for local good food. So there have been quite a few discussions over the last couple of days around what regenerative means and, and having some sort of certification. I mean, I'd just like to put that one to bed. I mean, I'm sure some of you have been to one of these discussions. Um, but just, you know, where, where are you on that, Ed? Uh, well, I don't think we're going to put it to bed on in, <laughs> in, in this conversation. But um, uh, our approach has been to write a definitive set of standards, which... Uh, we didn't come up with ourselves. It was a collaborative effort. Everything we do is community-based. 
uh, Andy and the rest of the other members of the team drove the length and breadth of the country, taking advice from farmers, from agronomists, from policymakers, and wrote a definitive set of standards that we got third party audited. Now, if there already was something like that, we'd fall under another banner. But if we spend our time arguing that my standards are better than your standards, are better than his standards, we're never going to get anywhere. So what we'll say is this is what we stand for. These are the people who have checked it. So you know that what we're saying has happened has happened. And I think that's the way we tend to, we want to breed trust. There are 463 eco certifications in the UK. It's my opinion that the customer or the consumer is confused and disengaged. However, there are a load of brands that people feel very strongly about one way or the other. And what I want Wild Farm to be is uh, a brand that becomes a beacon of doing things the right way. When Patagonia started making uh, climbing gear, he made great climbing gear for climbers. We want to be associated with making great food with the best in the business. And then the way that we're supplying things should almost be a secondary thing. Of course, it's done that way because that's how the thing that we call regenerative agriculture today will just become agriculture. Tim, you've got a brand that we care about a lot. I mean, I think you've got a similar view to this. No, no, no standards required. You said to, I remember when we were chatting, you said, uh, um, we're all going to get to be regenerative farmers in the end and it doesn't really matter how we get there. Am I misquoting you? Um, I think the Soil Association have agreed with the Advertising Standards Authority that organic is regenerative and that you can claim that organic is regenerative. Um, but I think if you wind it back a bit, what we're, what we're really looking at across lots of things, energy, transport and agriculture, is decarbonisation. Um, so in energy and transport, decarbonisation is about technology, it's about solar and wind and nuclear. In, in transport, it's about hydrogen in the front here, hydrogen cars, it's about electric cars. And when you come to agriculture, I think we're sort of caught in the headlights and are we looking for technical solutions in terms of the decarbonisation, in terms of growing things in bioreactors as a sludge and then pretending they're food, or are we looking for biology, which is much more important? So I think physics and chemistry, you know, play out in the decarbonisation of the other ones, and I think people are assuming that physics and chemistry will apply to agriculture, whereas actually we need to introduce biology and life. We are, you know, and therefore, you know, if you look at the degradation of world soils, the point I was making, I think, when we chatted earlier, was you cannot continue to degrade soils because you therefore will have no biology to produce any food. So it is a matter, is, you know, it's, a ma it's not a matter of when, it's a, ma you know, it's a matter of it will happen. Um, it's a matter of how, will, how fast it will happen is, I think, the, the key point. I think to Tim's point there, in energy and in transport, there were vast government um, incentives of the like that we haven't seen in agriculture yet to make those changes. Those things didn't just happen uh, naturally. It's my opinion that the farmers have to not bear the financial risk of this, and it has to be borne initially from government, who we know are slow, and I know they're trying, but it's nothing like the comparison of energy and transport, and then the consumers will come along because brands will make it available, existing and new. Yeah, I think to add on to that, I think the government announced £20 billion of mechanical carbon capture support at the last budget, um, and they can't even get themselves to fund a UK national soil carbon code, where we've got three times the carbon than, um, than in the atmosphere. So I think the government are just looking for green jobs, green investments, you know, more people to make more money out of investing in technology. Because let's face it, if you go back to soil-based agriculture, you're not going to be buying the inputs from the agro-businesses. You're not going to be buying as many tractors. You're not going to be buying all the inputs. And therefore, it's not an incentive for lots and lots of current businesses that support agro-business to um, support regenerative or organic farming. How many are you going to?
So, oh, it's going to bring it back to the, the question on regenerative certification. Yes. So I think that's where we started. Um, so <laughs> I think there was a whole session on regenerative certification yesterday, and that was a whole hour spent on, on where it should be. Um, and, there, you know, there are certifications that exist out there already. Um, there are, you know, there are five. There's the, the new regen Regenified standard, which it was developed by Understanding Ag, and that's being trialled in the US. Um, so they are coming, but the... I think we're, we're, we're actually sat on stage with some real heroes here. And, uh, and like Ed was saying and, and Tim was saying, what we're actually doing is the brands are kind of self-policing. They are putting their standards out. They are putting to the consumers exactly what they're doing. The consumers are they're getting trust in what they're saying and they're delivering on those points. So uh, I think before we, you know, everything is evolving and we're, and we're moving, you know, ev there's so much happening in re this regenerative space. and. We're s as we learn and as we build and as we kind of create more, s more systems and understand what the system complexity is, the way forward is to make sure that we are supporting the brands that are, do that are being honest and they're putting out exactly what they're doing, they're self-policing and, and putting good food on people's tables. Mm. And I think that will crowd in the bigger businesses as well. There's nowhere to hide this day and age if, you're, um, if, if you fall out of the, the, the public's uh, good books. We've seen it with other big brands have done things. Um, Bud Light's one, nothing to do with our world, but it has, in the space of a uh, you know, matter of months, been cancelled in the US because they, they, they alienated their core base. And I think consumers are going to want more from their pound uh, than just a product. And I think these supply chains are going to come under greater and greater scrutiny from consumers as well as tests from geopolitical and weather events. I'm, I'm hoping there are going to be a lot of questions. Um, we've got a fabulous audience here. So um, I'll give you another... I'll, I'll ask one more question, but I'm, I'm hoping you're all ready to go. Um, I mean, my, I just wanted to pursue... I mean, Tim and Ed, you both talked a bit about it, but it, do we need some support? Do, what, what, if, if, there was, if, if the government said, well, we've got, I don't know, a billion or five billion or whatever, where... Because, where, you talk, Emily, you talked about... Britain being ahead of the rest of, of Europe on this. I mean, I, on organics, that's not the case. And, you know, the places like Austria and Sweden, they've reached tipping points where, you know, it becomes much, much easier. The flywheel moves much faster because it becomes normal to, to consume organic food. And there, there has been regulatory and uh, support and financial support. So what, in a world, in a, in a, in a cash strap world, what could we do? What could we hope for from our politicians just to get this over the line? Have you yeah, well, I, I would start again with farmers' net margins. Um, if farmers are making no less money for growing food this way, it will find its way into the system. And there's a whole other world around public procurement, which is um, as we work with organic in Denmark, um, which I, I'd say between those two, will fit that everybody else in the middle of which you know, we are on stage. Uh, I think um, I think it will work its way through if we could aim at those two places. Have you got any thoughts? Uh, I, I guess it's just um, making sure that sustainable transition can happen. Uh, and, and we know, you know, th there's been a lot of talks over the, the last couple of days where, you know, regenerative agriculture is stacking up and people are able to make money out of it. Um, so that there is, but there is the drop in yield as you make that transition. And I think that's probably the key part where, you know, banks, financial lenders play a role is, is actually supporting that transition. Uh, and I think that's where we need, you know, a bit of a step up um, from funders, from governments. I mean, Tim, the, you know, you make a very important point. I, I was on a board call yesterday whilst here and talking to colleagues who are, you know, international investors. And we've made an investment into a company that pulls carbon out of the atmosphere. And it does it very well and it's very certifiable and it's incredibly popular. And I'm in the middle of a... Regenerative farming conference, and my colleagues are saying, "Oh, William's at one of his farming events. How lovely!" And I think you know, this this whole system is just so much more efficient. But what what do we what does what do we have to do to get big business, or you know, can the government support it? You know, you you throw it up in the air. What's what's the answer? Do we just accept that it's never going to happen and get on with it ourselves? Um, I think. It I mean, we've always at Yeo Valley been a massive supporter of farmer cooperatives. We source all our milk through farmer cooperatives, mainly because we don't want to deal with farmers directly, actually. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, 
there's a checkered history in that, I mean, dairy is very close to what we do. So there's a very checkered history, and the government has seemed to have done everything they possibly can to stop farmer cooperatives, and that's the where the farmers own the manufacturing um, to actually succeed. Um, we've now got First Milk and Arla, both farmer cooperatives, both very, very interested in regenerative farming. FIA Farms run the Arla Regenerative European Project, which we're part of. First Milk, I think, are converting, or I think they're claiming that they're going to have 100% of their farmers signed up to regenerative practices. So, and that's like 800 farmers, which is 10% of UK milk. Um, so I think it's going to happen with or without the government. Um, but I think we're all paying, I think it, it used to be 25% of our electricity bills to the wards the green levy i think it's 10 percent now because the levy you know the bills have gone up through the roof um but that is billions and billions of pounds the government have used to get solar panels and wind farms built at economic levels and they just don't seem to realize that if they did exactly the same that farmers could not just stop degrading farmland but they can actually start storing carbon um, and then all the benefits that that would have to resilience um, in the farming system. So questions from the audience? Good. I'm going to try and work out how to open this water can. Um, Sorry. Thank you so much. This is a fantastic talk. I, I want to applaud you for five minutes. Um, but I'll get, get on with the question. The question is really, um, because of the questions you've just been discussing, have you had any contact with between Re Regenerative Ag and um, Mariana Matsukato, who does the public policy and public value stuff? Because she's all over governments in terms of supporting transition. And I don't know if she's picked up this sector yet. But my God, I didn't even realise that it was a three to what, you know, three times the amount of carbon. And I'm not sure how many people have got that simple message. So I just wondered if you're talking to her because she's a mover and a shaker and she might be able to crack this. No, I haven't. And I think to that point um, of, the, of the, um, the people who William was referring to, the reductionist mindset of financial investment is such that they say, here's a machine that can take carbon out of the atmosphere and that's the one thing we're trying to achieve. But as we've all learned from food, when you just focus on one thing, there are unintended consequences, much like everything that we're living out now from the Green Revolution. And that reductionist mindset in investing has got to change. It's stuck in the last century. My apologies to your friends and colleagues. Uh, it's stuck in the last century. It's, uh, it's um, kept moving by people who benefit from it. And I think we have to start thinking more holistically because sure, uh, all the big um, investment management companies and, uh, and the management consultants, they like carbon because they can measure it. So it works for them. But a field that's sinking a lot of carbon is likely doing an awful lot for biodiversity too. And uh, that's much harder to measure at the moment. We're working on it. I would like to know what Emily's got to say about it. And again, when we can start measuring the biodiversity, will um, William's friends be uh, getting a mechanical biodiversity tool? Or will we have the humility to accept that we don't really understand why this is going on, but it works? Yeah, and there, I think there's lots of exciting new ways that we will measure, uh, and, we're, and we look at outcomes, so we look at ecosystem processes and, and what we are delivering on an outcome level. Um, and But there's so much going on. It, like, this is really exciting. There's a lot of research, and you know, there's people talking about kind of measuring nutrient density, and, and can you actually show um, ecosystem processes on a nutrient density level? Like, there's, there's so much going on. Another question. Hi, um, I've heard very little reference in kind of the talks I've been to around the pricing for consumers in a climate where we have hospitality kind of closing um, on a regular basis. We have consumers choosing cheaper proteins and cheaper cuts um, within the climate. What there's obviously government incentives for farmers um, to do. Uh, sort of better work and we're all for making sure the farmers get the best price but what incentive is there for customers to have a price that is accessible for everyone um, to scale this up to the high street I think it's about moving moving everyone on the journey 
um, and if we are making sure that the the, um, the business case is made for the farmers, we it's really difficult to think about pricing structures because it should be it should be available for everyone. Um, and if we're producing it with the right gross margins, then it should be available. Jim, I, th I think it's about priorities because there are some facts that so like 30, 40 years ago we used to spend 30% of our our disposable income on food. It's now down to 10%. I saw some market figures the other day that said um, that we're now spending more money on mobile connectivity on Netflix, your iPhone, your Wi-Fi, than we are on food. And therefore, the food's share of the our disposable income is going down and getting squeezed even further. Um, the government's um, inflation rhetoric is that it's being driven by people going to festivals and people spending money on their holidays. So, you know, I think the, the at some point we've got to value the food that makes us healthy. Um, and if we think that can be 5% of our disposable income, 10% or 15%, I think it's all of, up to all of us to make the right decisions of what is going to make us healthy and the planet healthy. And if we, as a society, continue to put things that are creating harm to the planet ahead of things that are doing the planet good, um, then I think we just need to change our purchasing habits and our priorities. And, and surely, I mean, to, to be able to do that, we need information. And, you know, the consuming public on the whole doesn't have adequate information about some of the food that it's eating, a lot of the food it's eating. So, um, you know, we make choices about drinking alcohol now. We, we pretty well know we make choices about whether we smoke or not. These were all things that in the past, um, the, the science was not there or it certainly wasn't well publicised. And, and, and yet there seems to be a reductance to, you know, to, to publicise and from a government to actually act on it. So, you know, to your point about pricing, I mean, I think people make choices. And, of course, there are always people who struggle with not having enough money to make to be able to make those choices there are people who can't make choices about their energy suppliers at the moment and they have to use expensive meters but you know we we do need some si strong signals and i think the majority of people will make those choices but they need information they need to understand it they need to you know it's not just a few people who come to festivals like this who need to understand what the food that goes into them what impact it has okay another question claire I mean, just following on from that, is there a role for labelling? I mean, we have labelling on cigarettes. Surely some of this ultra-processed food should be labelled as such to give people that n information choice. Um, I think there are lots and lots of labels that are confusing. Um, I think the Advertising Standards Authority have overseen the rise of ultra-processed food from 15% to 55% as an average. I think it's 65% in certain social economic sort of categories like 15, 18 to 25 year old men are consuming 65% ultra processed food um, and therefore I would suggest that they're not fit for purpose nor is the mergers and markets authority which have overseen and allowed all the mergers and of all the businesses that are, are selling us this food. I think labels are very complicated there's been huge initiatives to try and get labels across lots of food personally I would just tell people at the till what percentage of ultra-processed food they have consumed and what, process, what percentage of healthy food they have consumed. So I would take it beyond labelling and make it mandatory that on your ticket at the till you were told the amount of ultra-processed food that you'd put in your basket. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with Tim in that actually if you, you, have a, you make it mandatory to label against the bad things rather than getting people to jump through hoops to do the good things. And what about taxation? I mean, same thing. Lower it on beer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Any more, any more questions? Desire. Hello. Thanks for that. It's really interesting. Um, I, I, I kind of feel that a lot of the stuff around metrics and measuring, it's a way of avoiding addressing the problem, you know, by, by addressing the source and by, by having the metrics, you don't have to address the fundamentally broken nature of some of the big corporates that are supplying us with food. And I would like to make an appeal for activism and say, let's be politically active. Next year, we have an opportunity to, to change the government or to tell the government that wins what we want to see happening. And I think use your vote, engage with 
local politics, and that is a way to affect change. And I think it falls into a particular kind of category of um, kind of capitalism, if you will, to try and do everything through consumer. I don't like the word consumer, particularly like food citizen, but I think, you know, what is the role for politics in this? How can we engage with politics in order to affect a wider change and that cultural shift that we so desperately need? Great point. Josiah, one of my Suffolk neighbours, and behind the wonderful brand Hodner Dodds, which um, I hope you're all, all consumers or food citizens of. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. Thank you. Is there one more question? So at the front. Yes. Thanks. Fascinating discussion. Martin Wright from Positive News. Is there any tension between the growing enthusiasm for rewilding and regenerative agriculture, or are they completely harmonious? What do you think, Tim? Um, well, as a farmer, my job is to produce natural, healthy food, and therefore rewilding is something that we don't really engage with. And, you know, it might be okay in certain areas, but if it's going to be done on agricultural land that is able to help and feed and regenerate soil health, I'd prefer to go for food production through a regenerative system than rewilding. I mean, I, you know, the, 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 the food, the, the land sparing, land sharing debate has you know, gone on for even longer than the do we need a certification system. And I, I don't have a very strong view on it. I mean, it seems to me that most of the science around land sparing probably relates to countries other than the UK. We've been farming here for thousands of years. The biodiversity loss that has, we've seen has taken place in the last few decades. So we were farming extensively, regeneratively, even though we didn't label it a lot, for thousands of years. But clearly there are areas that were brought into production uh, during the Second World War which probably need to go back. And there are landowners who choose to rewild and they're doing wonderful things and they're still producing food, maybe less than they were before. So to me, the, the two systems can sit very, very harmoniously together, particularly in the UK. But there are iconic species out there that don't like people and they don't like the, the, the interference of agriculture. And I think that's the, that, those are the areas where the, the land sparing argument needs to be promoted very strongly. I think we've run out of time. The my timekeeper is telling me that. Thank you very much for coming. It's been very hot in here. Thank you very much to, to Ed, who has disappeared. But um, thank you very much for Ed for coming and for being such a stalwart. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Tim, for showing us your films and for providing us with a tent, even if it's a bit hot in the end. <laughs> <laughs>